My topic today is youth, democracy, and development. Youth, democracy, and development. What is youth? What is democracy? What is development? The youth, according to the UN, are people between the age of 15 to 24. The African Youth Charter is more generous. It says there are people between 15 and 35 years. But what's more important is to say young people are a reflection of society. They come from the poor people. They come from the rich people. They come from the middle classes. So the young people, the youth, are a reflection of society. They have the potential to be the barometer of social consciousness. But more importantly, the youth are the most dynamic and the most uh, active members of society. Democracy, we go back to Lincoln. A government of the people, by the people, for the people. It's about agency. It's about majority rule. It's about self-determination. It's about saying those that govern must do so with the concern of the government. That's what we talk about democracy, representative democracy, constitutional democracy. The issue of freedoms, the issue of rights. We must make sure that in the representative democracy, we also protect the rights of the minorities. So the issue of indivisible human rights, indivisible freedoms and rights. Development, what is development? Development is the process, the activity, of improving the material conditions of the people, their social, political, and economic well-being. Can we improve the social, political, and economic conditions of our people? That is what we mean by development. It's about economic growth, but it's more than economic growth. It's about ensuring people's capacity, people's capabilities are improved. The quality of life is improved. That's what we mean by development. In fact, we can say development can be understood as freedom. Development can be understood as democracy. In other words, there's an interplay between democracy and development. In fact, we can change the definition of democracy and say democracy is the summation of experiences of struggle by the general of the people as they seek to improve their material conditions. That's what we're talking about today, young people, democracy, and development. But now, let's go back to history. What is the history of young people? What is the history of young people as makers of change, as creators of destiny, as creators of change? Democracy is here in Mozambique. Why and how? Because of young people. A young Eduardo Mojandi, a PhD, young PhD. Samora Machel, a young male nurse. Marcelino Dos Santos, a young man. Alberto Chipande, firing the first shot to bring about the freedom in Mozambique. The women, Marina, the freedom fighter. Gracia Machel, the freedom fighter, Josina Marshall, these were young people your age, between 15 and 24, between 15 and 35. They were makers of history. The freedoms you enjoy today are because of Josina, are because of Marina, are because of Samora Marshall, they are because of Alberto Chipande, they are because of Marina. This is the history of Mozambique in terms of young people. Beyond Mozambique, Chris Hani, young Chris Hani, young Mandela, young Sobukwe, young Tomogara, young Chitepo, young Kwame Kruma, young Ben Bela. In America, the civil rights movement, young Malcolm X, young Martin Luther King, young Black Panther Party members, U.P. Newton, Bobby Seale, Fred Hampton. By the way, go and find out about these people if you don't know them. 
They were young like you. They were makers of history in America, makers of history throughout Africa. The young people, the youth, have potential to create legacy. They have the potential to create a new reality. That's what we learn from history about the youth. The youth brought democracy in Africa. The youth brought civil rights in America. The young people brought about the end of apartheid. Winnie Mandela, Ruth First, Joe Slovo. This is what we're learning from. Now the question is, what are you going to do to be creators of history? What are you going to do to make a difference? What are you going to do to be a Marcelino Dosonas? What are you going to do to be a Samora Michelle? What are you going to do to be Marina? What are you going to do? The way to do it is to say, what are the major questions of our lifetime? What are the major questions and challenges of our lifetime in Mozambique, in Africa, and in the world? What are the problems? In the 60s, in the 70s, it was about self-determination. It was about freedom. It was about democracy. One person, one vote. And the young people stepped up to the plate and became makers of history. Now, what is your challenge? What are your questions as young people in the year 2018? Number one, the issue of economic prosperity. Are we prosperous in Africa? No, we are not. Is the prosperity shared? Is the prosperity inclusive? Is the economic growth inclusive? We got a problem of economic prosperity in Mozambique. We have a problem of economic prosperity in Africa, in America, throughout the world. You want some demonstrations? Mozambique. What's the population? 29 million people. GDP, we can be generous and say $15 billion. Some people say $12 billion. That's a problem. And in any case, GDP is not a good enough number. Let's look at another number called per capita income. What is the per capita income for Mozambique? 400 US dollars. That's a problem. There is no prosperity in Mozambique. We've got a problem. $400 as the per capita income. GDP, $15 billion. We have issues in Mozambique. Go to South Africa. No, you think South Africa is a South Let's look at the numbers of South Africa. GDP, $300 billion. Looks interesting. Population, 50 million people. Let's look at the GDP. Per capita, $6,000. You might think South Africa is doing well. There's a, a more interesting number. Forget GDP, forget per capita income. There's a number called the Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient is a number that measures inequality in society. The rich versus the poor, the Gini coefficient. Zero means there's perfect equality. You people are equal, zero. Hundreds means there's absolute inequality. So the G coefficient is measured from zero to hundred. It is a more important number than GDP. It's a more important number than the capital income. Now guess what? South Africa has the worst G coefficient in the world at 63.1. 63.1. It is the most unequal society of all countries with all that $300 billion GDP, which means South Africa has major issues around shared economic prosperity. Nigeria, another superpower, 190 million people, GDP $400 billion, per capita income $2,500. Here you can see, there's no sharing of that $400 billion GDP. The GDP coefficient for Nigeria, 49. Serious inequalities 
in Nigeria with all that oil, all that gas. These are the issues of your lifetime. Shared economic prosperity. Mozambique, your number for the gene coefficient is 46. That's pretty bad. Inequality. There are some rich people, some bowlers in Mozambique who are doing so well. And then there are villagers and poor workers and poor people on the other hand. 46. The countries that are doing very well in terms of shared economic prosperity are your Nordic countries, your Norway, your Sweden, your Switzerland. Their numbers are around 20. The Gini coefficient is 20, 22. Those are very equal societies. I am saying to you as young people, find out what the issues are for your generation. What is your color and call? What is your mandate? Samora Michelle, Marcelino, Marina, they responded to the challenges of their time. Yours is about economic prosperity. Go and create the jobs. Go and be an entrepreneur. Go into politics and fix the economy. Tell us what you can do to improve and work on economic prosperity. Another target of your time, the SDGs. You've heard about the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN Goals, 17 of them. Can you help Mozambique achieve the 17 SDGs by the year 2030? Do you know what they are? Go figure, go find out what the 17 are. Poverty, hunger, infrastructure, the climate, environment. There are 17 goals that the world has set up to achieve by the year 2030. These are the challenges of a lifetime. What can you do as a young person to ensure that Mozambique is able to achieve all of the 17 SDGs by the year 2030. These are the challenges you must work on. You have read about the climate agenda. You have read about the environment. The issue now is about economic development, which is sustainable. What are you going to do about the environment, about global warming, about preservation of the environment, about effective work on extractives? How can you work on the extractive sector so that we empower Mozambicans, but at the same time, we protect the environment and preserve the future? These are the potential areas, questions of your lifetime. Another agenda for you, is continental integration. Don't be satisfied with Mozambique. Uh -uh. Remember your independence. Samora Michelle was backed by Africa. Mozambique backed Zimbabwe. Zambia, Angola backed South Africa. The independence of Africa was a collective effort. Your challenge is to make sure we have an effective, united, integrated African continent. Integration of the continent. What can you do to bring about a unified African continent? What can you do? And by the way, it's your challenge because these leaders uh, are not going to do it. You have an agenda to create a United States of Africa. The United States of Africa is one of your issues. And by the way, don't listen to them when they say, the youth are the leaders of the future. The future belongs to the youth. Reject that. Lock, stock, and barrel. Reject that. Youth are the leaders of today. Young people must lead today, not tomorrow. Don't allow the older people to tell you the future belongs to you. Don't allow the older people to say you are leaders of tomorrow. No, you must lead today, like the examples from history. Now, how to get there? How are you able to be 
a maker of history. How are you be able to make to be able to create a legacy? Number one, education. The tools now. What about the tools? The strategy. Once you have a vision, the next step is how do I come up with a game plan? A game plan, a strategy to move from where I am to the promised land. Education is number one weapon. The most powerful weapon of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. The most powerful weapon of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. In 1975, what we got in Mozambique was physical decolonization. Physical end of Portuguese rule. But when did Portuguese rule end in your head, in your mind? In Zimbabwe, 1980, what we got was physical decolonization. But mental slavery continues in Zimbabwe. In South Africa, 1994 was about physical end of apartheid. Mental apartheid is still there in our minds. So education is a weapon, is a tool we can use to bring about change. Get an education, formal education, an informal education, self-empowerment intellectually. A, 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 a weapon of struggle you can get by educating yourself by reading widely. So education in the classroom, and outside the classroom. In fact, the education you give yourself is more important than what you get from the classroom. But you must feed your mind. You must get what we call a primer in intellectual self-defense so that you become a player. Those chaps, Samora, Eduardo, they read. The Panthers, Malcolm, Martin Luther King, they read. I'll just cut a few of them to show you how forward they were. Public Kuma in 1963, when they were forming the African OAE, what did Public Kuma say? The independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it is linked to the independence of the rest of the African continent. Progressive thinking, Kwame Kuma. Ben Bela from Algeria. What did Ben Bela say? The revolution of Ben Bela from Algeria. Let us die a little so that Rhodesia can be free. Let us die a little so that South Africa can be free. These were leaders who were informed. Education is important. Number two weapon. Number two weapon is new values. You need new values. Self-awareness. Empathy. Negotiation. The old values won't work. You need new skills. You have heard about IQ. Intelligent caution, IQ. IQ is not enough. It's necessary, but not sufficient. You need more than IQ to be a rock star in this world. Number one, you need what we call emotional intelligence. The ability to understand your own feelings and those of others and navigate within society. Emotional intelligence, you need that. Cultural intelligence. You need that. The ability to move in and out of different cultures and produce premium results. Different business cultures, different political cultures, different social cultures, and maintaining superior results. Cultural intelligence. You need what's called spiritual intelligence. You need what's called existential intelligence. Go and find out about these new types of intelligence. These are the tools, the weapons you need to be able to create history like Samora did. Information is key. There's so much information in, on the internet. Yesterday there was a discussion where they mentioned silo uh, mentality or silo information. They, somehow there's asymmetric information, information asymmetry. Find a way to use social media. Find a way to use the new information age to bring about change. Sometimes you have so much information, very little knowledge. There is fake information, fake news. Find a way as young people to use information to bring about change. The most important one is what we call the fourth industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution was about steam power. The second industrial revolution was about electric power. The third industrial revolution was about electronics and information technology. 
Now we're in a new age called the fourth industrial revolution, which is about artificial intelligence, human augmentation, augmented reality, nanotechnology, blockchain technologies, quantum computing. All these new technologies must not frighten you. Go and find ways of using them to bring about change. Don't think that the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence, robotics, these are for Japan, these are for America. No, sometimes they're more applicable, easier to use in Africa than in those places. You want an example? Mobile banking. Banking on your phone. Do you know the best world practice? The best examples of mobile banking are not in Japan, they are not in America, they are not in Europe. Kenya, Mupesa. Zimbabwe, Echo Cash. Very advanced technology where you bank on your phone. The best example in the world is Kenya, is Zimbabwe. How did it happen? Why? Because our poverty because our lack of development becomes an opportunity. In America, in London, in New York, the bank is next door. The bank is in your bedroom. There are brick and mortar banks everywhere. Why would you bank on your phone? But in Africa, 70% of our people have no access to brick and mortar banking. That's a problem, but an opportunity, which allows mobile banking to be applicable in Africa. So, one of the tools you can use as young people to bring about change is embracing the fourth industrial revolution and finding ways of using these technologies to create development, to create shared economic prosperity. Quantum computing, human augmentation, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, blockchain technologies. But of course, you need a new value system, what's called interdisciplinary uh, learning, what is called uh, comprehensive core competencies. These are the tools you can use to bring about your revolution. The last thing that you can use to bring about changes young people is the issue of integration. Now, Condendo integration is both a vision and a tool. By uniting as Africans, we can achieve more. By working together as SADC, we can achieve more. Think about it. I said the GDP here in Mozambique is $15 billion. The GDP in South Africa, $300 billion. Zimbabwe, $13 billion. Mozambique, uh, um, Botswana, $60 billion, and their population, 2.3 million, million people. Now, these are small economies. These are too small to make a difference. Now, when we come together and say SADAC, what are the numbers? In SADAC, we have 280 million people in SADAC. The collective GDP is $600 billion. Now we are talking. Those numbers allow us to negotiate better. Let's go further. There's the FTA area. We have uh, Comesa, EAC, and SADAC together. The FTA area. What are the numbers? 680 million people in the FTA area. What is the GDP? 1.3 trillion dollars. Can you imagine if we go and negotiate as 680 million people, that resource, and we pull our resources together, and then you say our GDP is $1.3 trillion, you are able to negotiate better. But it gets even better. Let's look at the African Union, the continental free trade area. All of us working together as Africans. What are the numbers? 1.3 billion people. 1.3 billion people. What is the GDP of Africa together? $2.3 trillion. Can you imagine? If you're going to negotiate with China, negotiate with India, negotiate with America, on the back of 1.3 billion people with a GDP of $2.3 trillion. 
Here's the question, here's the issue. Mozambique must never negotiate with China as Mozambique. Mozambique must never negotiate with India as Mozambique. You are too small, you get short changed. Zimbabwe, South Africa, Botswana must never negotiate a single country with a big economy like China. Can you imagine if you woke up and say, Madam China, Madam India, here I come, I'm the African. I speak on behalf of 1.3 billion people. I have a GDP of 2.3 trillion dollars. Can you imagine the leverage you are going to have with India? The leverage you are going to have with China, with America. When you come is 1.3 billion people as you come with 2.3 trillion dollar GDP. I'm saying to you, integration is one tool you can use as Africans to survive under globalization. All these deals in Mozambique and China, Mozambique and Russia, Mozambique and Britain, we are being shortchanged. We must work together as African countries and be able to leverage our scale and scope. And also, can you, remember, can you imagine if we work in clusters? We say diamond clusters. Diamond, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Angola, working as a cluster for diamonds and rubies. We'll be able to name the prize for diamonds and rubies throughout the world because we have everything there. Zimbabwe, South Africa on platinum. 90% of all platinum between the two countries. We are emphasizing that one of the tools you can use as young people is the regional integration of SADC. The regional integration of COMESA. The regional integration of the FTA. But more importantly, the continental free trade area, the AU, as a weapon to bring your, uh, the people together. Those are the tools you can use. As I finish now, I want to emphasize the issue of leadership. Leadership is important. Step up to the plate and be a leader. Now, there's a big debate in the academy. Are leaders born or are they created? What is the answer? Are leaders born or are they created? None of the above. None of the above. Leaders are neither born nor are they created. They are not created. Leadership is a decision. You choose to be a leader. Leadership is a choice. You self sacrifice, you self select. Alberto Chipande was not created by Harvard or University of Mozambique. He made a choice by shooting. The gun in 1964 without any education. Samara Masha was a male nurse. He didn't go to Harvard or Oxford or Cambridge, but was a revolutionary in South Africa, Southern Africa. He created Mozambique as a male nurse. He wasn't born a chief or born into royal blood. Mandela was not born a leader. He did go to Harvard. He went to Fort Yeah, he didn't finish. He later on finished with UNISA. He was not a superstar. He wasn't eloquent. He was an average speaker, average intellect. But he made a choice, a decision to be a leader. Locked up for 27 years, he created a state called South Africa. He ended up hearted. Gandhi, an average lawyer in South Africa, mediocre lawyer, average lawyer in South Africa went to India, stood up to power. Today, Gandhi is an icon. Malcolm X was a dropout, grade nine dropout. When you see Malcolm speak, it's like he's got 10 PhDs. Leadership is a decision. Leadership is a choice. Leaders are neither created or born. They know that they are it's a decision. So I want you as young people to make a decision to be leaders. I want you as young people to realize that as a Mozambican, you will never be respected 
unless and until the entirety of Mozambique has done well. I know some of you think I'm going to be a manager, I'm going to be an engineer, I'm going to be a superstar journalist, I'm going to be a professor. You will never be respected. No matter how much money you make as a Mozambican individual, no matter how much power you accrue as a Mozambican, no matter how much education you get as a Mozambican, as long as the average Mozambican is not doing well, you will never be respected. More importantly, as Africans, let us work together. Don't constrain yourself to Mozambique. Your freedom was the product of African efforts. You also liberated Zimbabwe, South Africa. We are together as Africans. We must all succeed. So as an African, you will never be respected as an African until the African people across the world, the African Americans in America, the Africans on the continent have done well. And so with those words, I want to encourage us to have questions and comments. But uh, remember, the moment is yours. Take a step. Be a leader. Make a decision to be a leader. Leadership is a decision. I thank you so very much. Tenho duas questões. Um, a primeira tem que ver com a educação que o professor Mutambara se referiu. Que tipo de educação a gente precisa em África? de modo com que esse desenvolvimento possa se refletir ao nível de África. Segundo e último, é que se referia aos grandes ideais, sobretudo de Kwame Nkrumah e outros líderes pan-africanistas, que tinham o ideal de construir os Estados Unidos de África. A minha pergunta é como é que a África, e nós os jovens em particular, podemos rumar para uma integração em África, que possa nos levar ao desenvolvimento. Porque em África nós temos uma diversidade de culturas. Temos a situação da Nigéria, do Sudão, que se desintegrou, que tanto o professor Mutambara se referiu. Como é que essa integração em África, e naturalmente incorporando os jovens, pode catapultar o desenvolvimento? E também a questão da educação, que tipo de educação nós queremos, o tipo de educação nós podemos ter em África com vista a incrementar esse desenvolvimento. Muito obrigado. Os países africanos ainda têm uma grande resistência, sobretudo potências como a África do Sul, a Nigéria, que uh, mostram-se resistentes à unificação da África no sentido de se unir às pequenas potências, uma vez que elas se impõem como quem uh, tem mais potencial. Então a minha pergunta é como é que nós podemos, qual é o ponto de partida que o professor sugere para a unificação da África, tendo em conta que existem aqueles que se consideram potências e que ainda sentimos que há uma resistência, começando por, por fenómenos como a xenofobia. Outra questão, a última, que eu acho que uh, esta é uma recomendação para a Oxfam, uh, que eu acho que deveria ser incorporada, eu acho que é um debate que já está a ser levantado a nível mundial, uh, que tem a ver com a quarta revolução tecnológica. Penso que este tema deveria ser uh, incluído. Então, de que forma os jovens, nós jovens, esta questão é para todos nós, como é que nós estamos a nos preparar para esta era que já está a, a entrar para a nossa vida e nós não estamos a conseguir uh, incorporar, uma, uh, uh, particularmente sobre a profissionalização. Muito obrigada. Eu gostava de saber, Dr. Mutambar, se não seria esta uma oportunidade para os nossos líderes, ou seja, para que possamos alavancar o nível de de desigualdade social em termos económicos e gostava de saber também que, visto ser Moçambique um país rico em termos de recursos minerais, será que com a integração regional, tornando os Estados Unidos de África, ou seja, uh, indo mais para o contexto atual, a poligamia da integração regional, não é de certa maneira complicar o, a, a economia do nosso país, fragilizar, por assim dizer, a economia do nosso país? A última questão, estávamos a falar dos 3.3 trilhões de dólares com a integração regional. Eu gostava de saber de que maneira esses 3.3 trilhões de dólares poderão se refletir em termos de PIB per capita. Pois sabemos que Moçambique tem uma, tem uma boa população, mas existem, existem países né, de África que tem uma maior população. De que maneira isso poderá, ao invés de ser um ganho, ser uma perda, tratando do contexto atual? Muito obrigado. Eu acho que o... 
a forma de nós termos uma boa educação, nesse caso, melhorar a nossa educação, é aquela questão de nós não esperarmos apenas a educação formal. Nós vemos muito bem que as nossas escolas tendem a formar o estudante para ter 20, 18, mas em termos de preparação para a vida, temos muitas lacunas. É normal nós vermos um licenciado, por exemplo, depois de uma formação, abandonar a sua esposa, alegando que é pura. Será que existem pessoas puras? Uh, se formos a olhar para a teoria das inteligências múltipla, múltiplas, todos nós temos inteligência, só são diferentes. Há quem tem uma inteligência emocional, há quem tem uma inteligência mais ligada à arte médica ou outras questões sinestésicas. Então, nós como estudantes devemos muito bem respeitar cada uma dessas inteligências porque em conjunto é que formarão aquilo que é o nosso ser. E também é importante continuarmos a ler e termos uma análise crítica. Is a person because of other people. Collective success is more important than individual success. Yes, you can learn from China. Yes, you can learn from India. Yes, you can learn from America and Europe. Why don't you also learn from yourself? The African has made contribution to history. The African has had African heroes. So we need an educational system that taps into our own knowledge systems, indigenous knowledge systems, our own wisdom, our own values, a decolonized educational system. The most powerful weapon of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And if we are not careful, the educational system in Mozambique, in Malawi, in South Africa, is simply reinforcing the colonial values. We need an education which is based on technology. Technology right now is a big equalizer. In every field, if you are studying sociology, history, psychology, if you are studying law, you must master the tools of technology, social media. Technology is now a prerequisite. So we need a technology-based education. We need to teach differently. Technology is key. Now, the issue of young people um, and culture. Culture is overrated. Ah, oh, no, how can we unite? Our cultures are different. Guess what? The borders we have are artificial. They were designed by white people in 1884 in Berlin. Berlin Conference. In Mozambique, there are people who speak Shona on this side of the border. And Shona on the other side of the border. There are Ndao people here and Ndao people here. There are more Tswanas in South Africa than there in Botswana. There are more Swazi people in South Africa than in Iswani or Swaziland. So these borders are not our own. These borders are artificial. Whatever cultural differences we have, we can manage. We can negotiate. So don't worry too much about cultural differences. They can be managed and mitigated. And in any case, the borders themselves are false. Now, in terms of the AU, why we're having problems, and uh, I think a colleague here has already identified the issue. Kwame was strong. Gaddafi was strong. These current leaders are not strong on African integration. You know why? When we succeed, when we have the United States of Africa, there will be one president in Africa say from Burundi. News here will be Minister of Local Government. Cyril Ramaphosa will be Minister of Police. Munangago will be Minister of Agriculture. Kagami will be Minister of Education. Are these African leaders ready for that? <laughs> Is News ready to be a minister? Is Ramaphosa ready to be a minister? Is Munangago ready to be a minister? Is Kagami ready to be a minister? No, 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 they are not ready. They want to be president. Of starving people. <laughs> you want to be a president of 2.3 million people, a president of 29 million people, a president of 50 million people who are starving. Shame on you, African president. Why do we need 54 of them? 54. China, 
has 1.3 billion people, just like us as Africans. They have one president. They're doing just fine. America, they have one president who's crazy, but they have one. <laughs> the Americans have one president. The Indians have one prime minister. So why should we as Africans have 54 men, not even women, men, who's <laughs> president? Sovereignty. They love their national sovereignty. There is no such thing as a free lunch. If you are going to have the United States of Africa, if you are going to have integration, you must give up on some aspects of national sovereignty. You must give up on your delusions to be a president of stabbing people. Our people will do much better with one president. The per capita income, the Gini coefficient, all these numbers will be much better when we are united. But the African leader is the challenge because they want to be president. <laughs> you raised a very important point. Nigeria and South Africa are a problem. They think they are big. They are not big. When you look at India, India has 1.2 billion people. Its GDP is $2.5 trillion. China has 1.3 billion people. Their GDP is $11 trillion. The American GDP is $19 trillion. So South Africa with its $300 billion GDP and 50 million people is nothing in terms of globalization. Nigeria with the 190 million people and a GDP of $400 billion are nothing vis-a-vis -vis India, vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis America. But they don't understand, they don't get it. It's almost like you are the biggest frog in a pond. I'm big, we're in a pond. Why don't you go into the sea? So we need to educate our brothers in Nigeria, our brothers in South Africa, that we are going to do much better together. You can't survive in South Africa under globalization. You can't survive as Nigeria under globalization. We must work together with our number. What are our numbers? 1.3 billion people. GDP, 2.3 trillion dollars. Can you imagine if you had to rock up and say, here I come, I'm the African. I speak on behalf of 1.3 billion people and my GDP is 2.3 trillion dollars. They will listen to you not out of love, out of economics. So, but I, 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 I understand, you know, the CFTA area, the Continental Free Trade Area, South Africa only signed yesterday. Others signed in March. But South Africa was dilly darling. ah, no. How can you, a South Africa, refuse to sign the Continental Free Trade Area, which will boost Africa together? And in any case, South Africa is number last in the world. You are the worst country in the world. Worst. In terms of inequalities, I gave you the number 63.1 gene coefficient. And yet, South Africans were circumspect. Ah, we don't think this unit is good for us. But anyway, I'm happy they signed last week in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, AU. But it, which makes your point that they are not convinced that uh, they think that they're superior, they can do a lot on their own. They can't. I hope they understand and work together. And the xenophobia. How do you have Africans in South Africa attack other Africans? Uh, and you don't attack Polish, you don't attack English, you don't attack Portuguese, you attack African. Black African attacking black African. Decolonizing the mind. Apartheid colonialism taught us to hate ourselves. So when you see another black person, you hate them because you are poor. The poor in South Africa are attacking poor foreigners. That is the problem of colonialism. The poor attacking the poor. The poor blacks attacking the poor blacks. That's why we're emphasizing that we are all the same people. And we as Africans must understand that we'll never be respected until we all do well. But I, I agree with you, there's a problem with xenophobia, but we need to work on our consciousness, work on our education, improve our economics. The poor South, South Africans will not be attacking if their econo economic circumstances were better. But it's an issue that needs to be done. The fourth industrial revolution, you know, we, we, we need to have a conference on this. 
your lives are going to be different. The way you teach, the way you learn, the way you work is going to be different. The fourth industrial revolution will change everything. So we need more time on the fourth industrial revolution. We need more time on the fourth industrial revolution because it's going to change a lot of things. Quantum computing, nanotechnology, blockchain technologies, augmented reality, human augmentation. I don't have time to define these terms. I, I hope we have a, a moment at some point to, but it will change everything. Every industry will be different. Yes, we need to work on that. How? The way you do it is by mastering technology. The way you do it is by having new values. The way you do it is by stepping up to the plate, by creating job. Don't be a job seeker, be a job creator. You know, this illusion that, no, if we unite, maybe our minerals are going to be abused by Botswana. If we unite, maybe Malawi will eat our diamonds and our rubies. Very narrow-minded. When you come together, everyone does well. I gave you an example. Let's say on coal, we come up with a cluster, Mozambique, Botswana, Zimbabwe, South Africa, as a cluster for coal, or a cluster for diamonds. Will be the biggest cluster in the world. Will be able to negotiate at better prices than Botswana can do on their own. So, the minerals you have in Botswana will benefit yourselves even more when we are united. There is no way you are going to lose by integration. Integration is a positive. Integration will make you benefit uh, and not lose. Self-education is more important than formal education. They won't teach you in class how to rebel. They won't teach you in class how to overthrow the system. You think, <laughs> you think uh, uh, Lenin, Marx, Samora, Che Guevara, and Castro were taught revolution in the classroom? No. You have to teach yourselves how to rebel. And talk about all the people, deny. Fight them. Don't ask. Take it. Samora took it. Alberto Chipante shot his way to fame. So if you are going to ask and ask, you will never get it. Be the leader, be the president, be the MP, be the mayor, be the councillor, be an entrepreneur. Don't ask, demand. Be the leader. Gender. It's very important. That's why I was emphasizing Marina, Josina, and we also have Luisa, who is a technocrat. We have, you know, uh, Winnie Mandela. Women, Queen Zinga. We are Nehanda in Zimbabwe. Women have been creators of history even before the whites came to Africa. In Zimbabwe, we are Nehanda. She was in charge of our struggle for independence when the whites came in the 1890s. Women have always been active. And by the way, just to dramatize, you know, yesterday they talked about human rights and so Women rights are human rights, yes, but they are more than human rights. They are smart economics. When you empower women, you are empowering society. When you empower girls, you are, it's smarter economics. There's a field that we call womenomics. It's a new word. Take note. Womenomics. <laughs> The economy is driven by women. The economy is experienced by women. The economy is impacted by women. Womenomics. There's research that has been done that women are better managers than men. Women are better leaders than men. And you know, I mean, men, I, I don't like saying that, but <laughs> there's evidence. So when you empower women, when we empower girls, you're not doing them a favor. You're doing yourself a favor because your company will make more money because women are running it. Your country will perform better because the women are running it. We are emphasizing the business case, the economic case for empowering girls and women. It's not charity, it's economics. Yeah, and remember that historically, women were players, women were leaders. And it's important that as you push feminism and all these other issues, you take cognizance of the African woman who was a leader, the African woman who fought like Marina, who fought like Josina. 
These were soldiers. So women must feel empowered by that. And so most of the other comments were knowledge and uh, contributions. But uh, I want to emphasize on this point that you must be a player. You know, we go to Gandhi, we go to Kennedy. What does Kennedy say? Ask not, we're paraphrasing, ask not what the country can do for you, but rather what you can do for your country. Ask not what Mozambique can do for you, but rather what you can do as a young person to drive economic prosperity in Mozambique. Be the change you seek to see in Mozambique. That's Gandhi now. Become the change. Be the change. Be a player. I thank you so very much for this opportunity. <laughs> for those who want to read, there's a copies here, and uh, yeah, the discounted amount of 200. That's whatever it says. But uh, uh, we'll do that after that. Yeah. Thank you very much for this opportunity.